In this revision lecture of the waves and oscillations topic, I'll start by giving you a very brief summary of each of the lectures, and then there'll be lots of questions for you to practice answering. In lecture one, we looked at simple harmonic motion. It's a type of periodic motion where the force is proportional to the distance from the equilibrium position and directed towards the equilibrium position. We saw that xt is equal to a cos omega t plus phi is a solution to this problem. For a spring and a mass, we showed that omega is equal to root k on m, and omega is just the normal meaning, the angular frequency, 2 pi f. We also considered the energy for simple harmonic motion. We said the total energy was a half kA squared, and this was equal to the kinetic energy and the potential energy stored in the spring at any point in time. In lecture two, we saw that the projection of constant circular motion onto an x or y axis undergoes simple harmonic motion. We use simple harmonic motion to derive the formula for the period of a pendulum. We also use simple harmonic motion to derive the formula for a physical pendulum, which is one which is pivoting about a point. We said that in reality, the simple harmonic motion is usually damped, and so we usually get damped oscillations like this, where the amplitude drops off with time. If we have an awful lot of damping, then we don't end up with any of these oscillations. The critical damping is the lowest point at which the oscillations completely disappear. We also saw resonance. We saw that if we apply a force with a frequency equal to the natural frequency of the system, then it's possible to get resonance and the amplitude of the motion can get very high. If there's no damping, theoretically it would be possible for the amplitude to go to infinity, though in reality this doesn't happen. Damping decreases the amplitude of the motion. In lecture 3, we met the wave equation y of xt is equal to a sine kx minus omega t plus phi. Y of xt describes the motion of the particles, so this is a transverse wave as the particles are moving perpendicular to the direction the wave is travelling. K is the wave number, 2 pi on lambda. Omega is the angular frequency, 2 pi f. If kx and omega t have opposite signs, then the wave is travelling to the right. If kx and omega t have the same sign, then the wave is travelling to the left in the negative direction. Phi is the phase constant, which we can use to make our wave match any initial conditions that we're given. We saw that there are transverse and longitudinal waves. In longitudinal waves, the particles oscillate in a direction parallel to the direction the wave is travelling. In lecture 4, we derived the expression for the velocity of a wave on the string. V is equal to the square root of tension over mu where tension is the tension and mu is the mass per unit length. We saw that we could use the equation the path difference on lambda times 2 pi is equal to the phase difference for two waves originating from the same source. If the waves come from different sources and aren't initially in phase, you need to take that into account and add the initial phase difference onto the final phase difference. We saw the principle of superposition that said that we could just add the amplitudes of the two waves at any point in space to get the resultant wave. And as an example, we showed that for two sinusoidal waves offset by a phase difference phi, we get y1 plus y2 is equal to 2a sine kx minus omega t plus phi on 2 cos phi on 2. So don't memorize this, but make sure that you are aware how to derive things similar to this. Lecture 5, we looked at standing waves. We showed that standing waves have the form y is equal to 2a sine kx cos omega t and that they can be split into a spatial and a temporal part. The particles that make up the medium undergo simple harmonic motion, oscillating with an amplitude 2a sine kx. We saw that for standing waves on strings, they must have a node at both ends, which restricts the frequencies and the wavelengths. So the frequency is given by V over lambda, which for a string is given by NV on 2L. So 
we saw that all possible frequencies on a string are integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. The fundamental frequency is what we get in this equation when n is equal to 1. In lecture 6, we looked at sound waves. We said sound waves were longitudinal waves where the particle motion is parallel to the direction of travel of the wave. So S of x t is equal to S max, the maximum displacement from the equilibrium position cos kx minus omega t describes the displacement of the particles and this leads to a change in pressure. The change in pressure is equal to B where this is the bulk modulus S max k sine kx minus omega t. The important point is that this is a cos and this is a sine. So the pressure difference and the displacement are 90 degrees out of phase with each other. We showed that for sound it had a similar velocity expression to the speed of a wave on the string. For sound it's given by the square root of the bulk modulus over the density. We also showed that the velocity is proportional to temperature as the density is changing. So the velocity is equal to 331 times the square root of 1 plus the temperature in degrees Celsius over 273. Or we could write V1 on V2 is equal to the square root of T1 on T2 where T1 and T2 are in kelvins. So the average power carried by a sound wave is given by a half rho. This is the density b the velocity, omega squared the angular frequency, a the surface area, s squared max the disp maximum displacement from equilibrium and we saw that intensity is given by power over area. So generally with sound waves they're spreading out equally in all directions and so the area is generally the surface area of a sphere 4 pi r squared. In lecture 7 we looked at sound levels, we said the expression for sound levels in decibels is 10 log to the base 10 i on i naught, where i naught is the reference intensity, it's 10 to the minus 12, which is given to you on your formula sheet. The Doppler effect describes what happens when we have a source and observer moving relative to each other. The frequency observed by the observer is equal to v plus the velocity of the observer over v minus the velocity of the source times f, where f is the frequency generated by the source, v is the velocity of waves in that medium, so for example 343 generally for sound waves travelling through air. We saw that when a source started to move faster than waves could travel in that medium, then we got shock waves generated and sine theta, the angle or half the angle that the shock waves make is given by V over Vs, where V is the velocity of waves in that medium and Vs is the velocity of the source. The Mach number is equal to Vs on V. Finally in lecture 8 we looked at air columns. We saw that for an air column closed at one end we had to have a node at that end so that restricted our allowed frequencies. For a column which is open at both ends, we need to have an antinode at both ends, which once again restricts our frequencies. And we saw that if we had two similar frequencies, then we would get a beat frequency generated. And in this case, the beat frequency is equal to F1 minus F2.